Hi and greetings. It's Wendy Lee and thank you for joining me to come to Yeshua Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth on YouTube and um, it's also known as Papa God Yahweh's prophetic and teaching ministry. Hello to everyone out there and hope you're ready for a good Bible study. Um, a deep dive into Father's message from September 23rd. I'm going to read it again and then we will go through all the scriptures for it. Hallelujah. So before I do that, let's go into prayer and please pray with me. Our glorious God Almighty in heaven above who sits upon your throne of grace, glory, mercy, and truth. We love you so much. We thank you for this opportunity to get together and listen to your message. And we thank you for your message. And we thank you for your word, your holy word, because your message is derived from your word. The word of God is derived directly from you, Papa. And you are, you are truth. Your beautiful and glorious son is our way, our truth, and our life. And no one can come to you, Father, except by him, except by King Yeshua. And no one can come to the son, your only begotten son, King Yeshua, Unless the Father draw him. Please draw all souls into King Yeshua. We know by your word that you want no one to perish. That you are long-suffering. And you wait for your precious fruit. We pray that you will reach out to everyone who lives on this earth as many times as it takes for them to accept your precious son. King Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Light of the World, the bread of life. And as we as Christians, we can claim you, King Yeshua HaMashiach, as our personal Lord and Savior. And we can claim a walk with you all our own because it's just you and us individually. Thank you so much for loving us, for allowing us to have a relationship so personal with you. Thank you for giving us a shoulder to cry on. Thank you for having mercy upon us. And thank you for dying for us, for our sins, for being raised from the dead on the third day. You endured the cross, despised the shame, for the joy set before you you did that for us and you are the author and finisher of our faith we love you so much and I ask that you are with me and everyone who sees this video I ask that you bless this video you anoint this video and you give me wisdom to teach your children You give me the wisdom to explain your word. We thank you so much. Please bless everyone in your ministry. Please help them go through whatever fires they're going to. Let them see you in, in it. Let them see you waving to them out of it, out of the tunnel. Let them see you. You are the, at the end of their tunnel, at the end of their fire. 
at the end of their refinement, at the end of their storm. And you are in the valley with them at the same time. For you go before us and you prepare. You prepare for us a way in this life. And we thank you so much for it. And please be with me as I read your message, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father, amen. Thank you for praying with me. And here is Father's message, <laughs> excuse me, from September 23rd, 2023, at 11.29 a.m. Daughter, this is your lowly and meek King Yeshua, God Almighty. Tell me, children, what and who is your God? Can he create without anything beforehand? Can he use anything for his purposes alone? I tell you, I am the only God, and there is none other. Children, do you realize that your God is? If he is not me, is made up by man. I am eternal. I was, is, am. I have always been and always will be. Can your God bring you blessings from above? Why is it you seek a God who can do nothing? Your God cannot speak, move, or hear. Do you realize that it is I who allow you free? will? What do you have to do for man's created God? Do you have to do all things with great fear of your God? I am Yahweh. I am your greatest fear. And yet you acknowledge your pride and stick your nose in the air and bow down to man's image. Thou shalt not have any gods before me. I am Yeshua, have cared for you, and thought about you, and loved you before I brought you to be. Yet you toss me aside every time I reveal myself to you. I tell you that a day of reckoning is coming, and you will cry out to your God, but he will not hear you. I am the final authority. I am your every chance, for I draw you to my perfect and holy Son, Yeshua, Jesus, and you insist God doesn't exist. You will not be held blameless. God Yahweh knows your blackened and wicked heart, and I know you, and I know you know I exist, for I have put a piece of me and everyone I create. Will you be found guilty or not guilty in my God, Yahweh's courts? If you have not accepted my son Yeshua, Jesus, and the only sacrifice I have accepted to cleanse your sins, then a guilty sentence I will give you. My son Yeshua, Jesus, has he not done everything for you when he gave his life at his cross. My beloveds who have accepted my son will have eternal peace and love with me, Papa God Yahweh. I invite you to come and dine with me and my son. Repent, for your eternity is even at the door. Yahweh. He signed it, just Yahweh. And every time I hear his name, Yahweh, or Jehovah, it just gives me goosebumps. You know, it's just the power in his name, Yahweh, Jehovah. Hallelujah. Glory to him. Glory to our God Almighty. Glory to Yahweh. Glory to Jehovah. Okay, 
So the scriptures, I begin with Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. So here it goes. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I took that directly from his introduction because he says, Daughter, this is your lowly and meek King Yeshua, God Almighty. And here, this is Jesus speaking in Matthew, saying this, that he is meek and lowly in heart. So that matches what he says in his, in his message. And let us cast off, cast off our heavy yoke and heavy burdens and take up his light yoke and his, I mean, his easy yoke and his light burden. Now, I took the liberty of looking up in Strong's what King Yeshua is meaning by his yoke, what his yoke is, according to the Strong's dictionary. And it said, it is a coupling, a useful, gentle, Pleasant, kind, servitude. Also, the beam of the balance. That's King Yeshua's yoke. Servitude. Remember we were talking, it's about our walk with him. Being exclusive to him and no one else. Our walk in King Yeshua. Our own walk. We are responsible for our own burdens. It's our own walk. And when we walk with him, we carry, we, we, I don't even want to say carry, we receive his yoke, his easy yoke, which means useful, gentle, pleasant, kind. It means servitude. It means the coupling. And it means a beam of the balance. So, so he is keeping us in balance as we walk, right? We turn this way a little bit, he'll straighten us back up. Figuratively, um, because we can walk like this for quite a while sometimes, or even further down. But when we belong to King Yeshua, he will bring the balance back in our life to him. He'll straighten us back up. Hallelujah. Now, before I looked this up, I didn't realize what yoke meant in this sense. Um, it's amazing what you can find out when you do some research, right? And I looked up my burden also. King Yeshua's burden. And burden is... What did I say? Burden means the freight of a ship a task or service. So the freight of a ship, like everything's piled upon you, right? But in, in King Yeshua's meaning of burden, he's taken the freight upon him. His burden, his light. And all you need to do is go in servitude to him. Follow him. Seek his face, right? Hallelujah. So I thought that was interesting. And I thought I might relay that to you guys. It's, it's good to take a deep dive, a deep study into God's holy word. And see what these words mean. And this is in the Greek. And you can go even further into the Greek, which I did somewhat. But for the most part, I just did Strong's. Uh, okay, so for the next scripture, I did Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, before Yahweh. 
And, uh, you know, in the beginning, Papa was talking about can your God create without anything beforehand? Can he use anything for his purposes alone? I tell you, I am the only God and there is none other. So that's why I wrote that. And Jeremiah 10, 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood. And there is no breath in them. Excuse me. And so I took that. Um. From somewhere in here. Anyway, it deals with a falsehood. Um, children, do you realize that your God, if he is not me, is made up by man? So the man makes a graven image. And the graven image, there's no breath in them because they're not alive. They can't, they can't see, they can't hear. They can't talk. They're nothing but vanity and deception. False gods. That's what they are. The same false gods that were back in the Old Testament days. They just changed names, changed tactics, you know, demons. They just changed things. They're the same because, unfortunately, demons are eternal and um, everything that God creates uh, seems to have an eternal life, you know, that's, that's alive. And the angels, which are fallen, I mean, the demons, which are fallen angels, they will, they're eternal, but they will spend eternity in hell with the devil. And this is at Father's timing, you know, at the end of all things, because Father tells us in his book of Revelations that after all things, after the millennium, after the millennial reign, excuse me, of Jesus, he's going to let the devil out for a little season. And then the devil's going to try to conjure up people to him. And then God says, that's enough. And he throws the devil into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. So, the the demons they just change tactics they just change names they just change how they do things but they're always going to be a copycat of what god does see they can never do what god does perfectly because god is their creator he created everyone and everything there's nothing been created without being created by god and god knew when he created them, what they would do. But he uses the evil, this fallen world, to refine us, give us a tighter walk, a closer walk with Jesus. Yes, he does. So Isaiah 45, 6, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Well, this is what he says. I am the only God, and there is none other. Children, do you realize that your God, if he is not me, is made up by man? I am eternal. I was, is, am. And I probably recorded this because he says, there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So Deuteronomy 27, 15. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Now just from memory, I didn't write this down, but I looked up abomination in the Strong's. And it's detestable. God detests certain things, and they are an abomination unto him. 
God detests men make engraven images or a molten image of anything. It's an abomination to the Lord. Bowing down and, and worshiping something that man made instead of the one true God is an abomination to the one true God. Because he reaches out to everyone and everyone just, not everyone, people just push him aside, unfortunately. All right, Revelation 1.8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. And I, I wrote that, see all this scripture I'm, I'm writing because Papa's talking about how he is eternal. He is the one true God. There is none else beside him. And that's what he's talking about in the, in the beginning of his message here. Jeremiah 14.22 can the worthless idols of the nations bring rain? Do the skies alone send showers? Is this not by you, O Lord, our God? So we put our hope in you, for you have done all these things. That's Jeremiah 14.22. And I wrote that because he says something about can you receive blessings? Let me find it here. Can your God bring you blessings from above? Only true God can. But the worthless idols of the nations, can they bring you rain? Can the skies alone send showers? No, only the one true God can bring rain, can bring showers from the skies. Only the one true God can send snow. Only the one true God can give you blessings from above. So, uh, I'm trying to think of that scripture where he says he gives good and perfect gifts. That's in James. I just want to find it because when I'm talking, I can barely remember what the scripture says. So I end up paraphrasing. So let me go. To James. Every good gift. This is uh, James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You can trust him. He doesn't change his ways. He doesn't change his mind. He is solid as a rock because God is our rock. Hallelujah. And he is the only one that can give us good and perfect gifts from above. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of your perfect gifts from above. And so Jeremiah is saying, Is this not by you, O Lord our God? So we put our hope in you, for you have done all these things. Going back to, he's the only one that can give us good and perfect gifts, blessings from above. Isaiah 41, 29. Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. So I wrote that because uh, why is it you seek a God who can do nothing? So, God is saying that the graven images are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Um, their molded images are wind and confusion. They can't do any works because they, they are nothing. They don't have any breath in them. They're not alive. They're just made up by man. And they can do nothing. They're wind and confusion. They're also called vanities. So Deuteronomy 4.28, And there you will serve man-made gods of wood and stone, 
which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. Again, this is scripture depicting how God is saying graven images, molten images, they can do nothing. And Father says it, your God cannot speak, move, or hear. And Deuteronomy states that. Deuteronomy says, your man made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. They can't do anything. Why would man bow down to an image that they say is a god, but it can't do anything? You have to move it, literally move it yourself. Why would you worship something that you created yourself and that you have to move yourself, that you have to do everything for it. That's just an abomination to God. It just doesn't make sense either. Um, there's a story in the Old Testament. I can't remember if it's the book of Judges. But it has to deal with... Um, the Philistines, I think, they captured the ark. Maybe it's in Samuel. They captured the ark of God. How did they capture it? Because Israel wasn't following the Lord. And they stuck out the ark of the covenant in their pride, in their heart, thinking that God would save them if they just put the ark of the covenant out there towards their enemies. That's not how God works. First of all, they had pride in their hearts. Second, they didn't pray. They just figured they'd stick out the Ark of a Covenant and boom, God would get rid of all of their enemies just like that, right? And so God allowed the Philistines to capture the Ark of the Covenant. But it's still the same rules applied to them. Um, they, they received diseases and everything. But the story I want to get to is they put the holy Ark of Covenant of God in with their false God. Vanity, wind, confusion, gods of wood and stone, which cannot see, hear, eat, or smell. They put the holy God, Ark of the Covenant, in with that garbage. <laughs> and the next morning when they went in there, the... The false god, I think it was a fish, had completely fallen down. And I, I, I can't remember, but I like there's several times that this happens. But I think the first time uh, he might have lost a head. But anyway, in one of those times, the, the false god falls down, and it's, and the false god falls down before the Ark of the Covenant, hallelujah, and loses the head. Because when it falls and crashes to the ground, because it's nothing, remember, it's nothing, it loses its head, hallelujah. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Glory to God. Glory to God. Just read that whole story. It's just fascinating, and you, you will end up laughing about it. It's, it is really funny, but uh, not in the sense as, you know, people getting diseases and stuff, but it, it's just funny. You need to read it, and I think it's in um, maybe Samuel, maybe Judges. I can't remember, but look for it. Definitely look for that, that story because it shows God is everything nothing can get ahead of god nothing can get above god god will humble you he will humble you hallelujah so joshua 24:15 and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's just beautiful. I'm, one of these days I'm going to get that scripture 
and put it on my wall. I don't have it yet, though. One day I'm going to get it. Um, I put that because he says, I am Yahweh. I am your greatest fear, and yet you acknowledge your pride and stick your nose in the air and bow down to man's image. Anyway, in this context, that's why I put that. As far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what Joshua tells the people. And you have a choice. Oh, that's right. Father says, do you realize that it is I who allow you free will? God could have created us however he wanted to. He could have created us as... I hate to say this, but people always say robots without free will, uh, always telling us what to do. And if we don't, you know, <laughs> we might not exist anymore. But he gives us free will. God and God alone allows us the choice to choose how we live our lives, to choose whether we live for Jesus or to choose whether we don't toe the line and go our own way. He gives us the choice. In every stage of our life, every season of our life, he gives us a choice. But he is always, 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 always trying to get our attention. Always. Don't ever think that God is not right there at your heart, wanting you to open it up for him. If you are lost, if you don't believe in Jesus, he is right there. He's waiting for the opportunity for you to say, come in, Jesus. I love you so much. Be Lord and Savior over my life. I believe that God raised you from the dead, and I confess you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah 2.19. Your own evil will discipline you. Your own apostasies will reprimand you. Consider and realize how evil and bitter it is for you to forsake the Lord your God and to have no fear of me, declares the Lord God of hosts. That's one of the saddest things right here. How bitter it is for you to forsake the Lord your God. This is God speaking. This is God's heart breaking because people ignore him. People go into apostasy and people are evil in their own hearts. Evil and bitter. And they ignore God. They reject his goodness, his kindness, his love. Isn't that terrible? Jeremiah 2, 19. Oh, boy. So, I am Yahweh. I am your greatest fear. And yet you acknowledge your pride and stick your nose in the air and bow down to man's image. Okay, Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's, that's, that's a deep one. That's a deep one. Because, because Papa Yahweh says, I am your greatest fear. The fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord, because he's holy and righteous and true. And he's a righteous judge. Hallelujah. So our Lord Jesus tells us in his Gospels, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. If we are in Christ, who should we be afraid of? If God be for us, who can come against us? That's related to what Jesus is saying. If God be for you, don't fear who can kill the body. But fear 
him. And, and also he says, don't fear who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. So they, they can kill your body. I mean, just look at all the, the faith stories, the martyrism. They can kill your body, yes, but they cannot take your soul. Your soul belongs to Jesus if you've given it to him. Your soul, your spirit, your heart. All of you belong to Jesus, and they cannot take that. They cannot. And they cannot take your joy. They cannot take your joy. The Lord Jehovah is our, our, our strength and our song. Your joy cannot take it. They cannot take it. It belongs to God, and he will keep us. God is our stay. And the, and the scripture says, instead, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. God did not create hell for man. He created it for the angels and the, the um, not the angels, the fallen angels, yes, the devil and his demons. Unfortunately, if a person doesn't believe in Jesus, then that person sends itself to hell. Because he doesn't want anything to do with God, and God will honor his request for all eternity. Is that the most horrible, atrocious thing you've ever heard of? To think of a person that has no hope. It's all gone. Because God is hope, and love, and joy, and peace, and you will have Nothing of what God gives you. Because God will vacate your life completely. And without God, there's no love. And you will be in eternal torment. Torment. Being placed where you don't want to be placed. Enduring what you don't want to endure. For the rest of all of eternity. And I looked up what eternity, eternity means. Eternal. It means perpetual. It means never ending. You will have never ending torture. Never ending fire. Never ending sin. Never ending wrath of the Father. So think about that. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, King of over your life. <clears throat> if you die without our Jesus, that's where you're going. That's what you'll have to endure. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Book of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. Look it up. It will tell you what hell is like. Matthew 10, 28. I'm sorry. There goes my memory again. Isaiah 44, 17. From the rest, from the rest he makes a God, his grown image, his graven image. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, save me for you are my God. That's disgusting. Nobody is God except the one true God, Yahweh. Jehovah. No one is God except the one true God. And I broke that because Papa God Yahweh is saying here part of the sentence and bow down to man's image. So they stick their nose in the air up to God. Hmm. I don't need God. You know, that type of thing. And bow down to man's image the thing that they made, the thing that they have to move on their own, the thing that has no breath in it, the thing that is not alive, the thing that can do nothing. Deuteronomy 5, 7, Thou shalt have none other gods before me. And Papa says it, Thou shalt not have any gods before me. Plain and simple. 
He's the one true God. Grace, glory, truth, and righteousness, and love. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained for me before one of them came to be. And then King Yeshua is saying, I am Yeshua, have cared for you and thought about you and loved you before I brought you to be. And this is that scripture. King Yeshua's eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained before one of them came to be, before this person was born, before we were born. God cares for us. He thought about us, and he loved us, even before we were born. Is that not awesome? Hallelujah. We serve a glorious God. Isaiah 2.12, For the day of the Lord of hosts, shall come upon everything, proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. And that is King Yeshua saying here, I tell you, excuse me, that a day of reckoning is coming, and you will cry out to your God, but he will not hear you. So the day of the Lord is coming, excuse me, and everyone who's proud and lofty, who has decided that God is not real, they don't want to bow down to the one true God, <clears throat> God's going to have his reckoning. And then he'll allow you to cry out to your made-up God, but your made-up God will not hear you. And your made-up God will not rescue you. It's going to be a sad, sad day. God's day of reckoning. The day of the Lord of hosts is what Isaiah is calling it. It shall come upon the proud and the lofty, upon the lifted up. In other words, they're sticking their nose up in the air at God, just like Father says. And... <clears throat> I looked up, I looked at what the word low meant in, uh, in Strong's, and it shall be brought low. Everything high and lifted up shall be brought low. And the, the word is, <laughs> I'm going to try to pronounce this Greek word, but you know it's not, probably not going to be right. Sheafel, I think that's how they pronounce it. And it means to be abased. It means to be humbled. It means to be humiliated. So everything that's lifted up and high and lofty and proud without God, without seeking God, will be brought low, abased, brought down to nothing. And probably just a heartbeat. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And I wrote that because, oh, because God says, I am the final authority. That's why I wrote this, because it says in this scripture, for there is no power but of God. God is the power. There is none other power. And he gives out, he gives out the power. He ordains the power to who he chooses. The powers that be are ordained of God. So he ordains people to have power. That can mean several things. That can mean the law. That can mean several, several things. And um, he ordains it. He is the only one that can ordain power to someone because he holds all the power. 
He is the power. Hallelujah. He is a final authority, as he says in his message. All right. John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father, which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so Papa says here, for I draw you, well, he says, I am your every chance, for I draw you to my perfect and holy Son, Yeshua Jesus. And so, he also says, and you insist God doesn't exist. So that's why I wrote John 6, 44, because it's saying right here, no man can come to Jesus, the Holy Son of God, unless the Father, which has sent him, draw him, draw the person. You can't come to Jesus unless the Father draw you. And I looked up the word draw, what draw means in this, in this uh, context. And it means drag, draw. I don't know why they put the same word in as a description, but drag, pull, persuade, unsheath. So you are disarmed from all your pride and, and all that. You have to come disarmed to come to Jesus. It means persuade. Father will persuade you to come to his son. Father will pull you to his son. Father will drag you to his son if he has to in some cases. But no one can come to the son except the father draw him. And that is mentioned twice in the book of John chapter 6. So it is so very important that we know this, that we know that. And he disarms us when we come to Jesus, because when you come to Jesus, you are at the end of yourself. You realize that you have sinned against the mighty and holy true God, and it just upsets you to the uttermost. And you ask for forgiveness, and Jesus forgives you. Hallelujah. What it does not mean is that you have to change before you come to Jesus. It simply means you have been humbled. You have been humbled. Don't try to change yourself. It's only Jesus can break those chains, right? Only Jesus can change you, change your heart, change your heart's desires. As they come and live with you and abode with you because you invited Jesus in. Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I wrote this because Father says, let me read this whole sentence. You will not be held blameless. God, Yahweh, knows your blackened and wicked heart. And I know, you know I exist. For I have put a piece of me in everyone I create. And so I was wondering, where in Scripture does Father say he puts a piece of him in everyone he creates? This is what the Holy Spirit led me to. Because he makes man in his image. And I looked up image under Strong's, and it says likeness or resemblance of. So we are made in the likeness of God, or we are made in the resemblance of God. What that means, don't know. Something for us to ponder, because it's a huge mystery. But God says we are made in his likeness. Glory to God. We are made in the likeness, in the image, in the resemblance of God. Hallelujah. In Matthew 10, 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, this is Jesus speaking, 
But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. This is, this is a sentence where if you deny him, you'll end up in hell. But whosoever shall deny me before men, whosoever shall deny Jesus before men, him will I also deny, Jesus will deny you before his Father, which is in heaven. Meaning we don't have his precious blood, his sacrifice covering us because you didn't accept him. You didn't accept Jesus. You didn't accept his sacrifice he did for you. So when you deny Jesus, Jesus is going to deny you unto the Father. And you will have the wrath of the Father upon your head because you haven't been forgiven of your sins. You didn't give your heart to Jesus. You didn't ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You didn't repent unto him. You didn't say yes to Jesus. So this is really an awful, awful piece of scripture because it's saying you'll be denied by the Father if you deny his Son. And that's so very serious. And I looked up the word deny in the Strong's and it says, say no, repudiate disavow or reject so if you say no to jesus if you repudiate jesus if you disavow jesus if you reject jesus he's going to say no to you to his father he's going to repudiate you to his father he's going to disavow you to his father he's going to reject you to his father because he says deny me before men and I will deny you before my father. Ouch. This is serious. This is, this revolves about the only important choice we have in our life to choose Jesus or to choose death in hell. That's the most important decision we can ever make in our lifetime. The only decision that is important for your eternity choose jesus or choose death and hell that's it hebrews 9 14 oh and i i wrote that because because father says will you be found guilty or not guilty in my god yahweh's courts and that's Jesus coming to the, to his Father. Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now this is where I looked up the word eternal in Strong's, and it says perpetual, never-ending. Perpetual. Keeps on going. Never ends. And this is talking about the precious blood of Christ that he spilled for us. And I, I wrote that because Father, in addition to this beginning of his sentence, I'll read the whole sentence. If you have not accepted my son Yeshua, Jesus, and the only sacrifice I have accepted to cleanse your sins then a guilty sentence I will give you. Whoa. That's also a very serious, very serious thing. That's why I wrote Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, Jesus gave his life and blood for all of us who will accept him who through the eternal spirit, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus offered himself without blemish. This says without spot to God, without blemish, faultless, sinless. Jesus had no sin, never did, never has, never will. Purge your conscience from dead works. Without Christ, we are all dead. 
to serve the living God. Jesus is alive forevermore because he was raised on the third day from the dead after he gave his life, his blood for all of us, for those who will accept him, for those who will say yes to Jesus. Glory to God. Okay, so the next scripture, um, yeah, my son Yeshua Jesus, he not done everything for you when he gave his life at his cross. So this is probably why I wrote that. I will say this next scripture is, let me see what I have over here. This next scripture is this one right here. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. This is that scripture that I keep quoting to you guys. If you are not in Jesus, you will have the wrath of God abiding on you forever. And this is when Father saying, then a guilty sentence I will give you. If you believe on his son, you have everlasting life. And you, if you do not believe on the son, you shall not see life because Jesus is life. But the wrath of God will be, uh, wrath of God abideth, abideth on him. I looked up, okay, I looked up several things in this scripture. I looked up the word life, what what life is representing here. It means physical and spiritual life. Because we will, eventually we will have an incorruptible body. That it will be our body. It will be a resurrected body. And spiritual. Because we will be with Jesus in spirit for all eternity. Our spirit will be with our body, with Jesus for all eternity. Hallelujah. At the resurrection is the physical. When we die, his word says, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So when we die, present with the Lord, if you are in him. And also, judgment with the Lord. Bad judgment if you haven't received him. You, you will meet Jesus either way. But you won't want to meet Jesus if you've rejected him. You'll only want to meet him if you love him and have accepted him and believed in him. That's the only way you want to meet him. But you don't want to meet him if you have rejected him. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the dream he gave me one time. An encounter I had with him and it was not... I, I thought I was in hell in that dream. I thought I had done the sin that couldn't be forgiven. Because that's what it felt like. I had no hope. It was a hopeless dream. And I was sitting in front of my judge, King Yeshua. And he was not happy. And he gave me no hope. And I really thought that that was aimed towards me, that I was going to hell. But after all my tears, after that dream, after me seeking the Lord's face on that dream, because it really, really tore me up, really tore me up. And after seeking his face, that dream was to show me so I can tell others how hopeless you are in front of the righteous judge when you hit eternity. 
hopeless, no hope. And you know that you've done something that cannot be forgiven. You know it. It's, it's in instinct. You just know it. And you don't even have to ask him. You just know it. You know it. And it was the most awfulest, hopeless, worst nightmare I've ever had. It was awful, y'all. I, I, I can't even explain how, how black it was. Not color-wise, but just how black it felt. There, there was no life. There was no chance. There was no more chances. I was done. It was finished. It was done. My sentence had been proclaimed. There was no hope. I did not get Jesus' forgiveness in that dream. And I knew it. He didn't even have to tell me. I knew it. Please accept Jesus if you don't know him. Please accept Jesus. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. Please accept Jesus. And have the hope and life in him. Because you ain't going to want to meet the God of judgment if you have rejected him. And I looked up the word wrath. Well, let me go back here. I looked up the word believe. Um, the word believe and strong says have faith in and trust in. So we need to believe in Jesus and have faith in him and trust him. And then I looked up the word wrath. And the wrath means anger, passion, punishment, and vengeance. God's word says he will have vengeance. We are not to take vengeance upon our enemies here in the world. God will have his vengeance. God will have his vengeance. And it's going to be awful. Just like I was describing in that dream. It's going to be awful. And you're not going to have another chance. You're not going to have another chance. If you die without Jesus. So... Let's go forward on. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Glory to God, we're saved by his life. I wrote that because Father says, My son Yeshua, Jesus, has he not done everything for you when he gave his life at his cross? Oh, yes. He finished it at his cross. Jesus said it is finished before he died, and it is finished. And it says, Before you say yes to Christ, you are his, his enemy. You are his enemy. I looked up what enemy means. Hateful, hostile, and adversary. If you have not said yes to Jesus, you are hateful to Jesus, you are hostile to Jesus, and you are the adversary of Jesus. And you are on the wrong side of things. You better get right with God. You don't want to be God's adversary. You don't. I looked up the word reconciled, and it means changing to same position, meaning Jesus, we're here, we're at the bottom, right? 
We're at the bottom of the to totem pole, so to speak. Here's Jesus. Here's God. Because Jesus became human and died for our sins, he can come in the middle between us and God the Father. He comes in the middle. That's why he's called the mediator. He's in the middle. And he brings us when we accept Jesus, only when we accept Jesus. He comes to us. And he abides with us. And when we are conjoined with Jesus, well, we go up to the Father with him. Hallelujah. We are able to come to the Father only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Hallelujah. Okay, now Revelation 3.20 is Father saying, My beloveds who have accepted my Son will have eternal peace and love with me, Papa God Yahweh. I invite you to come and dine with me in my Son. And that's Revelation 3.20 where I found that. Oh, let me back up. I also looked up the word saved. In Romans 5.10, What's, what does save mean? And it means to heal, to preserve, to, to rescue believers from penalty and power of sin. Remember, if you don't have forgiveness of sin, you have the wrath of the Father abideth on you forever, for all eternity. So when you are saved, when Jesus saves you, he rescues, he rescues you from penalty and power of sin. Glory to King Yeshua. Glory to King Yeshua. Thank you for rescuing us from the power and penalty of sin. Hallelujah. So that's what the word saved means in that, in that scripture. Now let's go back to Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And of course, I wrote that. Father specifically says, dine with me and my son. Hallelujah. He says also, he invites us to come and dine with him and his son. And this is saying, I stand at the door. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And the word stand means sets up shop. Well, I wrote this. It means sets up, right? Stand, set up, don't move. And I said, sets up shop beside our heart waiting. Jesus doesn't leave. He sets up his shop right there, meaning he's steadfast. He is faithful, and he waits at your door for you to open it and let him in. He won't, he won't barge himself in, though. He won't. And uh, I looked at the, the word door also. And the word door means opportunity and in, or entrance, opportunity or entrance. So he's given you the opportunity to accept him. Please take it. Please take that opportunity. And he'll offer it to you and offer it to you and offer it to you. You must be cognizant enough to recognize Jesus is knocking on your door. Are you going to open it for him? Or are you going to leave him there? And so when you invite Jesus, you have the Father and the Holy Spirit with you also. Three persons and one God. And they will be with you forever. And they will dine with you here on earth. 
you know, because they're they're dwelling within you. You have the Holy Spirit within you. And then uh, Father says, repent, for your eternity is even at the door. And for that, I put Acts 2.38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the word repent says, change mind, think differently afterwards, Change the inner man. God's word tells us he works on the inner man. And we need to repent of our sins all the time. We're going to mess up. We're going to sin. And when we sin, we need to repent. And if we are in a, um, like a long hard road of sin that we can't get out of. Have perseverance. Persevere in Jesus. Keep knocking and asking. Just keep repenting and let God know that you're serious about repentance because that's a stronghold. That's a stronghold. And then there's the other kind where sin keeps a hold of you and you know it and you're prideful about it. See, a a stronghold that I was talking about earlier, you want to come out of it, but it's a stronghold that's holding you. The prideful sin is flaunting it in front of God. That's a prideful sin, and and it holds you captive. And you need to recognize that. You need to recognize your sinful pride, because that's what brought the devil down, is his pride. You need to recognize your sinful pride. Stop flaunting it in front of God, because God's going to humble you no matter what. And you need to come to Jesus. Haughty looks, God will bring down. So we need to repent continually, daily, more than daily, if need be. Repent of unknown sins, because there's so many sins. We do them and we don't even realize. So so repent of unknown sins that maybe you don't know about, but God knows about it. Just have a continual repentant heart, meaning when, when you know you have sinned, immediately come to the Father and ask for repentance, ask for forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And and repent daily. When you don't repent, say you're in Jesus, you're sinning, you don't repent. That sin just grows and keeps growing and continues to mess up your life. And not just your life, but others' lives, potentially. Because sin breeds sin, breeds sin, breeds more sin. So let us continually repent. And I looked up the name in Acts 2.30. And I looked up the word name. And it means character, fame, or reputation. So Jesus... His character, his fame, his reputation is all in his name. And it's all good. Hallelujah. I looked up the word sins. And it means failure or fault. We have failed God in our sins. And we need to ask for forgiveness of our sins through the mighty blood of Jesus Christ. 
And I looked up uh, when it's saying you will receive, I looked up receive, and it says get, take, lay hold of. So you will you will lay hold of the gift. The gift meaning you receive it without repayment. It is freely given, not acquired by merit or entitlement. We don't deserve God's free gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't deserve anything of God. We don't deserve Jesus. We don't deserve God. We don't deserve the grace and the mercy that he gives us. He gives it because he loves us that much. And I don't know about you, but I need all of God's grace that he's willing to give me. Hallelujah. I also look up the word holy and Holy Spirit. Holy means set apart uh, by or for God, different from the world. Holy means different from the world. We need to be holy. It says, be ye holy for I am holy. We need to be separate and different from the world. Separate ourselves out. Doesn't mean you hide in a hole. It means that you live your life. You love your family. You know, you, you commune with everyone. But you are different. And they see that. You don't indulge in the sins of the world. The lusts of the world. You don't do that anymore. Let them see your walk with Jesus. And it will be different. And they will say, I want that. I want that. How do you do that? How do you say no to that thing? And they'll want what you have. They'll want to say yes to Jesus when they see how much he loves you and how much you love him and how much you can say, my Jesus. When you have Jesus, you can say, my Jesus. Because it's personal between you and him. My Jesus. My Jesus. I love my Jesus. Hallelujah. So, oh, I also looked up forgiveness. I almost missed this. Forgiveness means a pardon, a release, a dismissal. God says he gets rid of our sins from as far as the east to the west. I'm paraphrasing. But he he takes away our sins completely. He just wipes them. He, he gives us a clean slate. He forgives us of our sins. Hallelujah. He willingly went to the cross and died so he can forgive us of our sins. Glory to King Yeshua. Glory to King Yeshua. So I have been putting Bible trivia up under the community tab here at YouTube. And hopefully y'all are enjoying that. Um, excuse me. I know you don't see it on the mobile. It's hidden, basically. have to go look for it. But just take a look at the community tab. And... Um, I'm not sure how you find it. It's just under the tabs where it says videos and uh, playlists and stuff like that. Anyway, it's involved in the community tab, one of those tabs. And I think it's the last one. That's where I'm communicating with you guys. And I'm posting scripture of the day and I'm posting uh, trivia of the day. And sometimes it's a question, some, and, and today was fill in the blank. So let's have fun with that. Let us take the dive into the scriptures with that. And perhaps it will help us memorize scripture in a fun way, in a fun way. Also, the scriptures that I do for Father's messages for myself, so I can start trying to memorize things. I, I'm writing them down. I'm writing 
even though I can copy, copy and paste on the computer, I'm writing them down. My hand is actually, you know, I, I'm trying to remember while I write them. And if I write them enough, maybe I'll start remembering them. I want them to be digested. I want to digest all of his word that I can get. I want his daily bread. How about you? Do you want the daily bread of Jesus? So maybe the Bible trivia, you'll enjoy it and have fun. And maybe it'll help you remember something. Definitely look at the scriptures that we just went over for Father's message. Because it relates directly to his message. Glory to God. So I will be back with another message of Father's. And um, I hope everyone has a good evening or whenever you watch this. And I pray that Father will bless everyone. I pray that if you are not saved, if you have not said yes to Jesus, that you will say yes and accept Jesus and believe in him and allow him in your heart. Allow him to begin a good work in you and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I'm going to quote 1 Timothy 1.17. To the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and, gl and glory forever and ever. Amen. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I need to mention here that Father God Yahweh has commissioned me for three and a half years to proclaim that the King of glory is coming, and who can stop him? Make straight his path. Hallelujah. Are you being a wise virgin, or are you being a foolish virgin? Please look at your walk with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In King Yeshua's mighty name, amen.